really founded the History and Archives Society is what I've started to call it. So welcome. This is a, a special day for us, and we're all glad that it was such a good turnout. Public speaking is really not my forte, um, and I, I have a little bit of a cold, so my apologies if, if I get a little off track here. But um, I thought I would just talk a little bit about what we're doing with the, the History, History and Archives group. Um, Malcolm and I grew up here and uh, both kind of developed a interest in old golf courses growing up here and, and golf course architecture. And uh, we both kind of started uh, getting involved a little bit with Golf Club Atlas um, on the side. Jim Bishop, by the way, holds a uh, master's in history. And so we, we started out with a kind of a nice group of people to get, get started with our history group. Um, Malcolm and I were fortunate enough to get invited to Marion and uh, spend time with uh, John Capers and Wayne Morrison at the archives at Marion and, and kind of give us some ideas on the direction we should go with our history and archives group. And that was a special, uh, special time. <clears throat> you may have seen John Capers on television a lot uh, right before the, the open at Marion. He got a lot of airtime, didn't he? Uh, uh, yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> quite a bit. It, it was kind of interesting to see. Um, Wayne's been very generous in supporting us here on some of the things that we're doing. Um, he's been a good friend of the club, and we've really learned a lot from him. I think we're all going to learn a lot today. Uh, <clears throat> in a nutshell, our mission um, at the history group is to identify, archive, and preserve an accurate history and record of the club, which really hasn't been done to any uh, consistent uh, degree in the past. Um, with an accurate knowledge of the club's history, origins, founders, members, and so forth, and those with a connection to the club, including the Princeton University golf team, I think we're, we're basically forging sort of a new identity for Springdale as an historic golf and a Princeton institution. And I feel very strongly from a, a membership perspective, it's a very good thing, and it's just something we ought to have at, at a club of, with, with such an interesting history. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of topics and things that we're going to get into over time. You know, the founders of the club, uh, there's some very interesting uh, history around the founders of the club. Two founders of Springdale, Percy Pines and Cleveland Dodge, were instrumental in creating the first municipal golf course in the United States at Van Cortlandt Park. Um, it's interesting to us that, you know, the original site of the golf course, the original Spring, uh, the original Princeton golf course before it was named Springdale, was out behind the Y. We're not sure exactly where it is, but we have a pretty good idea. We've had a lot of discussions about that. Hugh Wilson, who uh, designed Marion, was involved with uh, the club uh, <clears throat> playing at Springdale, uh, playing at Springdale as, as part of the uh, uh, Princeton golf team. He was captain of the team and obviously went on to design Marion, which is an interesting connection for us. Um, there have been a lot of notable and interesting members of the club through the years uh, and, and also members of, of the Princeton University golf team who played. Uh, well, we should really know about that, and I'll talk about that a little further in a minute. Um, Springdale is an interesting place in golf history. We were the sixth golf course to be to join the United States Golf Association in New Jersey, and probably one of the first 60 golf courses founded in the United States. I'm not sure exactly what what number that is, whether we're 60 or 68, something along those lines. Um, you know, we should keep a record of you know, who's won tournaments, um, the staff that we've had through the years, especially the golf pros. We've only had nine golf pros here. Is that right, Keith? You're the ninth golf pro, I think. Is that right? Okay. Um, you know, we should keep a track of who worked on the new clubhouse. So anyway, we've, we've started a nice committee. Um, we're joined by uh, Ruth Thornton, who's r already uh, got into a good project, um, wrote an article about women's golf here at Springdale. Mosey Gates has been working with um, <coughs> Jim Bishop on a lot of his anecdotes and history at the club. Elaine Armas has already uh, started working on um, some of the women's golf uh, history here, including the nine-hole group. And uh, she is also involved with um, creating a record of how the Princeton University women's team was started here. Uh, it turns out that Barbara Armas was the first captain, of women's captain of a varsity team at Princeton, which is kind of an interesting thing. Keith Stewart's been helping us, um, especially getting involved with the record of the golf pros, but on many other topics as well, and, and been joining us. Uh, Clarence Shutt right now has um, been helping out, and he's working on a piece about Woodrow Wilson, who. Uh, you know, was president of uh, Princeton and, and actually played golf here. Kind of an interesting thing. We've had several formal meetings and things are going well. We're starting to really organize things and uh, we're going to start having materials that you know you can look at and we'll get some on the website and we'll have them printed out here as well. So, um, you know, one of the things that we haven't done that we're going to start doing soon, I think, is 
collecting memorabilia about, um, the, about Springdale and uh, golf in this area. So if you have anything, bring it to us, and uh, we'd like to you know, start getting that sort of thing into our archives. Um, I wanted to you know, point out a special note about William Campbell, who um, was probably the best golfer that ever played at Princeton. And he died in, in late August. And I was fortunate as a kid in 1972 to caddy for Mosey Gates and uh, Bill Campbell uh, at the Princeton alumni uh, reunions uh, event on Friday. Campbell was really an amazing man. His, his record as an amateur golfer is, is, is staggering. He won the 1964 U.S. Amateur, uh, two US C USGA senior amateurs. He played in 37 U.S. Amateurs, played on eight Walker Cups, and was playing captain in 1955. I mean, this goes on and on and on. He played in 15 U.S. Opens, 18 Masters. He served as the president of the USGA and was elected captain of the RNA, the third American to do so. He won the USGA's highest honor, the Bob Jones Award in 1956, and was elected to the World Golf Hall of Fame in 1980. So that's, you know, we have all sorts of interesting his history here that we're kind of just scratching the surface on. Um, anyway, moving along, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our friend Wayne Morrison. And also, we have uh, the fortunate, we're fortunate enough today to have his partner who wrote the book, Nature Faker about uh, William Flynn, writing. Tom Paul, writing the book. <laughs> so anyway, Wayne is a uh, member of the Marion Golf Club Archives Committee. He's on the USGA Museum and Library Committee and played a key role in developing the USGA Architecture Archive as well. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Wayne Morrison. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, by the size of the crowd, uh, it's uh, uh, reassuring to know that people are interested in the history of the playing fields of golf. Uh, Tom and I have been collaborating for almost 15 years now on a history of William Flynn, and who's played such a pivotal role here. And uh, wives kind of look at us at askance and wonder why we spend so much time doing this. But the history of golf uh, is nothing without the playing fields and the understanding of the playing fields and the evolution of golf. And it's interesting how uh, American golf um, went in its own direction after it was introduced into the United States in the late 1890s. Uh, you know, America likes to put their own stamp on everything, and they certainly did with, with golf. And uh, this is an interesting place for many reasons. Um, Bill mentioned the, the, the members, the uh, the teams that have played here and, and uh, the presidents that have played here. So it's got a r really rich tradition in, uh, in, in play, but it's also a, a, an interesting to look at the, the evolution of the golf course because it was at the earliest days of American golf, uh, evolving through time through the, what's considered the golden age of golf in America, American architecture. And that's in the 20s and 30s. Well, it kind of died down in the 30s. The teens, the 20s and uh, early 30s. So um, the golf course has seen a, 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 you know, that kind of renaissance of, uh, of, of talented architects that have uh, left the, their stamp on American architecture. And uh, it's interesting to look at the earliest versions of what the golf course looked like, because a lot of people would scratch their heads and wonder, you know, is it a, is it a golf course or a steeplechase course? Um, so if we can just do a little bit of a background on the, uh, what the golf course or the club and golf course was like. This was the, uh, a, a routing map that was made uh, showing the golf course in 1897. I think it was about 2,400 yards long. But in the days of gutta percha, balls, you know, sort of uh, India kind of rubber, and hickory clubs, it was a, a challenging golf course at the time. And you'll notice that there's, this was off Baird Lane. It was down at slope. Not far from here. Yeah. So you, you, you see there was quarries and, 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 and a pond and streams. So they, it, was, it was laid out in, in an area with a lot of natural features. I don't, the quarry wasn't natural, but it was a, a feature utilized in the golf course. But the swamps and streams and things like that were incorporated in the design and certainly added a, a measure of difficulty to the golf course, 
especially in an era when it was hard to get the ball in the air even. So um, this, was eight, eight, this was the 1895 version of the golf course. In 1899, the, you can see that it was rerouted a bit. Uh, it actually was shorter. I, I'm not sure the, the reason, we, we haven't found the reasons why it was rerouted, but um, uh, this was the 1899 version. And then it was around this time that the, the, the club decided to, to move on to, uh, move, the, move the golf course. Uh, I don't know if this was leased land or rented land. Uh, it was, it was rented land. So they didn't have control of the property, and that was the case of a lot of clubs in that era uh, when land became more expensive and it was leased. The, the threat of losing the property loomed large, so uh, this was about the era when golf, co golf clubs were acquiring land. So um, this guy, Willie Dunn, a uh, very famous Brit uh, itinerant uh, British pro or Scottish pro came to America. I think he won the, the Open Championship. Do you know? Cornelius Vanderbilt fought him over. Uh huh. Um, they found him, his, his brother Tom was at, uh, uh, what's it called in France? Uh, Biarritz. Yeah. And so he was at Biarritz, and a group of Americans showed up, including Cornelius Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, you weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> but I was keeping my... That's all right. Okay, so everybody will get that answer right in the quiz. Um, so Willie Dunn was uh, engaged to uh, design a new golf course, 18 holes on this site. The go the, 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 uh, his design wasn't in entirely followed, uh, but uh, he's, it certainly was... Uh, a major structure of, the, of his design was incorporated. And here's a, a fellow that's near and dear to Marion's heart, uh, Hugh Wilson. Um, he was the captain of the golf team, a, a very good amateur player in his day, uh, kind of a spindly, sickly kind of guy, which is something that affected him throughout his life. But here he is uh, on the, the Princeton golf team in 1901. That's him there. Here's him as the gold medalist for Princeton. Um, here's his graduation picture. There he is, right there. And uh, he was on the he was uh, on the green committee that was involved in the development of the, of this golf course. And as a playing ca as a playing captain, he was certainly recognized as an expert. And much like the touring pros of today, expert golfers back then were, you know, deemed to be experts in design. Also, wasn't always the case. Isn't always the case either. But. Um, Still isn't always. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, he certainly left his mark in American golf. Not only the design, he just, he was involved in certainly Marion's golf course, two golf courses, uh, the first municipal course in Philadelphia, Cobb's Creek, Pine Valley, um, and a couple others uh, in the Philadelphia area. But uh, maybe even well, not as much as his legacy in, at Marion, but his legacy in developing turf science. And you know, it was one thing to build a golf course, it was another thing to play golf on it. It was hard to, hard to know what kind of grasses to use, what kind of uh, treatment to keep uh, turf playable for everybody. And he was instrumental in starting the green section and uh, developing the science of turf management. This is what the golf course looked like <coughs> on the property. Uh, you, know, you might be able to recognize some Princeton buildings here, the second tee, it was, it wasn't, there's was nothing there. It was just a flat piece of teeing ground. Um, here's the second green, just, just so built. You may not know this, I had to look it up. That water tower um, in the background, that was at the corner of Springdale and Battle Road, just to give you some more indication. Oh, okay. So these greens were not built up like the greens you see here. They weren't architected, so to speak. They were uh, just laid down on the natural ground. <laughs> this is an interesting, they, they would build these cops bunkers where they would dig this, where the sand would go and then they just pile the dirt up behind it. And this is where it's more like a steeplechase than a golf course. That was the fourth hole. There's the sixth green and this is Percy Pine putting. He was very instrumental in uh, the development of the golf course, I think as a you know, funding and also uh, promoting the game of golf here at Princeton. There you can see some uh, university the buildings. At the seminary. Oh, that's the seminary? Yeah. Wayne, also, if you go back to your 1901 golf team, you don't have to go back, but it's 
sitting in front of Hugh Wilson in that photo is Chris O'Brien. Yeah. All right, there he is driving on the seventh tee. Pretty good follow through. Here he is putting on the ninth green. He's got an awkward stance. But I guess they had to hit the ball pretty hard back then because the greens were probably. Tom, what, what do you think the green speeds were versus today? Five or six. Five or six feet where the putts today would go 10 to 12 feet. Looks like their house is where the old clubhouse That's Over correct. here? Yeah, you can see the old houses. And you can see the original eighth green. The gentleman that's right here. Were behind him, you can see the outline of the original eighth green for the Willie Dutch golf course. Mm -hmm. Do you, I don't, this is a postcard. I don't know if you've, have you seen this one? I did, Wayne. I, it was on a disc that Bill gave. <coughs> well, I gave it to Bill. It's, um, it's the Lambert course. You're looking yeah. down on the ninth drop shot. Here's the nine, drop shot par three. Look how rectangular that is and how linear this bunker is. Uh, naturalism didn't really come into play in the look, of, look and aesthetics of golf until a little bit later. And here in 1914, this guy, Jared Lam Lambert, Jerry Lambert. Lambert Sold a lot of Listerine in his day, had a lot of money, and was uh, involved in redesigning the golf course. You can see that, that you know, there's some movement to the golf. There's some dog legs and some, even though there's some square greens, he, he was trying to develop a more um, uh, curvilinear look to the golf course. So this was 1914 redesign. Graduate college is here. And it's the, route, the routing you see here is very similar to the one that exists today. Flynn, in his uh, parsimonious way, utilized as much as possible of the golf course, even though he was uh, improving it. Uh, one of the, uh, and this is what Tom's going to talk about, one of the uh, most influential schools of arch school of architecture, style of architecture, came out of Philadelphia, where um, uh, really it took golf architecture to another level. And uh, if I could pass this on to Tom, he could talk about what's considered the Philadelphia School of Architecture. Oh, sorry. This was, uh, before I do that, this is 1924 Ariel. There's this fellow named Dolan who you know, had a biplane. He would fly over and take pictures of golf courses and factories and things like that and sell them. Uh, fortun you're fortunate to have a number of aerial photographs taken. But here again, you can see the, the square nature of this green and the linear bunkering here and L-shaped bunkers. Um, the interesting thing that Malcolm showed me today, I hadn't never realized this, he blew up this photograph and there's geometric patterns in the green, ge geometric mounding. In this particular case, there's two triangles that sort of meet in the middle. And there's all sorts of other kinds of uh, things we'd look you know, as curiosities today, but were in vogue back then. And this was even through the 20s. So let me talk. Oh. That, that picture is very interesting because it, it really tells you in the 20s, you know, the golf course was moved here in 1902. There really were very few trees in the golf course. The design of the golf course, you know, utilized the features, not trees per se. Right. Um, not that we want to take all the trees out, but it, it is interesting to see uh, how the course developed. Right. And, and the trees down the right of Springdale. Yeah, Springdale. That's Springdale Road. Road. That's correct. And the Cleveland Tower, and, and the square green is the 16th now. Uh, Yes, yes correct. Old roughly, roughly the same old age. I, I don't think it's exactly the same, place, but mm -hmm. could, you, could you tell us about Lambert's donation of the property to Princeton University? I could not, but I bet you Malcolm could. Uh, well, Lambert never owned the property. The property was purchased by Moses Pine, uh, Stephen Palmer, a group of Princeton alumni purchased the property, which they then leased to the Springdale Golf Club. They put it into trust, right? Uh, they put it into trust and they leased the property to the golf course, the club, basically to the property taxes for, for the property. So it's, it was set up that way originally and at some point, and I can't remember the year exactly, it wasn't too long after the, the, the put into the trust, they conveyed, the trust conveyed to Princeton University, so they ended up the only I'm, I'm very interested in trying to figure out you know, if there was a deed associated with that conveyance, because there may be restrictions in the deed, um, you know. I think that's a whole other So Lambert didn't actually give the property to the university? No, Lambert was so never on the, the property was the Stockton family farm. Um, they were a Quaker family here in Princeton. Uh, this farm was named 
Springdale. And at first it was, we were the Princeton Golf Club for quite some time, but then they changed it to Springdale Golf Club because they were having problems with university students who just felt that Princeton Golf Club was part of Princeton University, was an amenity for them to come Are you sure that Princeton University actually <coughs> owns the property? Well, yes. we don't. But we, we, pay, we lease it from them now. Well, we lease it from them, yeah. 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 But I'm asking, is that legitimate? Well, the trust conveyed to the university, uh, I believe. I'm not a trust lawyer. Uh, we, we, have we haven't done a title trust. search or anything like that. Maybe we right. should. But I'm very interested in trying to find, you know, a document, the, the deeds that were conveyed. Right. Right. They may have restrictions in them, you know, that could be very useful in the future. So. Absolutely. Okay. You ready, Tom? If you want to just click, you know, this was that one you had before this or after this? Before. Okay. Go back to that. Yeah. Okay. And then I just click forward. Okay. Um, by the way, I think you were asking a question about who really owns it, and I, I do recommend that you do do a deed run, uh, just because. I mean, there could be some specifics in there that would be. Uh, Significant or, or historically, it could just be really interesting, yeah. you know, because of the way these guys did it. Okay, I'm asked to speak on the Philadelphia School of Architecture. Um, I, I, I'm going to wing this. I, I didn't really prepare, but we've done this before. I wrote this. Let me make sure I'm not going to contradict myself here. The Philadelphia School of Architecture, first of all, What's meant by the term school? Does it mean a, a discipline, a, a style? Uh, perhaps with some of the others, not really with the Philadelphia School, in my opinion, despite what you just said. The term school as applied to architecture, as far as I know, the first time it was really used with any currency was probably by Jeff Shackelford, who's probably only 45 years old now, a really good golf course historian and analyst. In one of his books, he wrote about the National School, which was McDonald, Rayner, Banks, the Ross School, the Monterey Peninsula School, and the Philadelphia School of Architecture. Um, the difference between the Philadelphia School of Architecture and the others was it, it really wasn't a style or any particular discipline. What it really was was five or six really close friends and they were all very good golfers. One of the uh, significant historical facts about them is five out of the six, or four out of the five, were these really kind of rich social wasp guys who uh, never took any money for anything they ever did in, in architecture. They didn't do it probably for two primary reasons. They were rich, they didn't need to, they also were all very good golfers, and in those days, if they took any money for architecture, they could lose their amateur playing status, which they didn't want to do. The only, are, are the men right next? Yes. Uh, the only one who was not that, oh, first of all, let me tell you who they are. They're, they're all famous today. Uh, Tillinghast, uh, uh, W. Tillinghast was one. He built a lot of courses, very famous ones, Wingfoot, so forth and so on. Um, Hugh Wilson, who really did a few courses, but his primary one was Marion, which he spent most of his career on. George Crump only really did one course, Pine Valley, which became the most famous course in the world. Uh, George Thomas, a super rich guy who built Riviera and a lot of other courses. Um, and could have been one of the real intellectual geniuses in the history of architecture. And then, who else is there, Wayne? There's, uh, there's well, not quite Flynn yet. There's, there's Phones, who, for that, he came from Pittsburgh, so sometimes we call it the Pennsylvania School. He, he was with Pine Valley, but these guys were rich guys who just kind of did it as the love of, of you know, golf. and. I call them the amateur sportsman architects because they, they, wh why did they not hire professional architects when they were doing these courses? That's the seminal question because today somebody trying to do that would hire a famous architect. I think they didn't do it for two reasons. Uh, in those days, the architects in America, or really anywhere in the world with the exception of perhaps old Tom Morris or something like that, were these 
itinerant multitasker guys who were, they were teachers, they were club makers, they were ball makers, they were, sometimes they were the greens keepers, um, and they did architecture on the side, and they did it really fast, like in one day for $25. They'd stake out a golf course, rushing around, and that was it. So these courses were not very good in the end of the 19th century, and uh, th these men, like the Philadelphia School of Architecture, just basically said, "We're smarter, we're better, we have, we're, have you know, background in in the classics from college. M most of all of them went to Ivy League colleges. We can do better." So that's what they tried. The interesting guy in this was William Flynn, because he was just this little Irish guy from Boston who came down here, what do we think, Wayne, 1910, 1911? To, to work on the crew at Marion. And the guy was, in our opinion, I mean, nobody's written a biography of William Flynn for Wayne and I, and obviously we never met him. He died in 1945, and the only person we've ever met who remembered him is his daughter. Fascinating interviews with her, by the way. And uh, he just was, I think, one of these kind of instant geniuses, if you know what I mean. He could look at a piece of property and basically route it in an afternoon, and one day he was that good. You know, some architects would need three months to do that. So, really good with agronomy. He was economically really efficient. So, he became like their little fellow, and he became like Hugh Wilson's sort of brother, if you know, little brother or something like that and he cut his teeth on the Philadelphia School of Architecture at Marion, basically, and then around the late middle teens, he started improving Marion architecturally, doing the drawings, marvelous drawer, and, you know, took it to the next level and became what we think was one of the most famous architects in American history, you know, Shinnecock, whatever. He did not do very many courses, and we think on purpose. He really wanted to sort of go the route of quality instead of quantity. So he only did, in a 30-year career, something like 52 or three or four courses where a Donald Ross built up to 400, things like that. Um, so here they are. This is William Fones of Oakmont. Uh, his father basically owned Oakmont. He's a very good golfer. He won the uh, he won the U.S. Amateur in 1910, was a very seminal guy in the creation of Pine Valley. So that's why we call it the Pennsylvania architecture. This is George Thomas, a man who uh, really never worked. His father was the managing partner of Drexel and Company, which is one of the biggest financiers in American history. And uh, he moved west in around 1919. Tillinghast, this guy, <laughs> he, a real genius, a little bit of out of control uh, emotionally, I think, but he really, he was another one. And Hugh Wilson of Marion. Uh, Marion was his primary project. He did a couple other things sort of with Flynn. Um, George Crump, a really interesting man whose only course that he ever did happened to turn out to be the number one course in the world, practically, um, and William Flynn. So really, it, it wasn't a style, because it, it, I don't think, because if you look at, say, Pine Valley compared to Marion, they're vastly different looking courses. They do have a lot of the same, what we call architectural principles, which was they got away from uh, the look in the architecture of that early aerial of this course that had these square greens straight across bunkers that looked like uh, steeplechase courses. And in fact, they really were a reiteration of steeplechasing. That's not just a name. We forget how completely closely related early golf in America was with the whole world of the horse transportation, recreation, everything. And so, you know, they had these fields of steeple chasing. If they took them out, they just would take the water out of the trough and put sand in it and a you know, fence right after that, and that's the way they did it. 
that was not very uh, artistic, wasn't very attractive, and it also didn't accommodate the whole spectrum of the quality of golfers, because good golfers could fly it way over those cross things. Others would struggle with it. So particularly these guys, some really intelligent, what I call amateur sportsmen, uh, got into creating sort of modern strategic architecture where you had to decide. It, it was a much more intelligent uh, outlay, basically, because you had to look out there and decide, you know, what if I went that way? Nothing was really dictated to you um, visually. So uh, other than that, um, there's one thing I somewhat hesitate to mention, but particularly with Flynn, was you know a little different than these other guys. Why did they take him in like that? I think it was because, well, first of all, when you do a book about a man like this you've never met, it doesn't take long to build up sort of a, a metal profile of what he was actually like. I mean, I wish I could talk to him and meet him, but Wayne and I are pretty convinced that William Flynn, he was a marvelous athlete. I mean, really good at everything he did, including golf, really good. I mean, he beat Francis we met when they were kids together in, in Massachusetts. He was small, kind of a fire plug. Today, with today's equipment, he could probably drive the ball 330 yards, long driver, everything. So he was kind of their man on the ground, if you know what I mean. But uh, so they got into this strategic architecture where you really had to think more other than just execute uh, physically. That's sort of the, the whole world of strategic architecture, which these men basically perfected. I think perfected worldwide. You know, it came out of America because abroad was a little, little, wasn't quite there at that point. So um, what else? I guess that's, is that, OK? Yeah. Do you have any questions about that? What did he die from? Heart attack. Oh. And l let me say this about his heart attack. Uh, I, I just want to say this is sort of a, in a kind of a cultural context. It just, to me, was so endearing. The only one that we talked to who knew him was his daughter, Connie Lagerman. She was quite old at the time. And when we went to her, um, no book had ever been written about him. And she was a very quiet, very stylish lady, and I think she was looking to us to sort of almost tell her about his architecture because she told us that he worked so hard and he was so sort of, uh, he, he was so ashamed of working so hard that when he came home, the one thing he never talked about is what he did, his architecture. So you give him flowers and everything. So she really never knew much about his business, and she said this, and I'll just leave you, this is my last remark. She said when she was, I don't know, six or seven years old and in school in Philadelphia, her little class was asked to get up and every kid would say what their father did for a living, and she said she was so embarrassed to get up and say that he was a golf course architect. That was nothing. And we said, Connie, what would you like to have said he did? Wish he'd been a salesman. <laughs> and uh, we said that, you know, look, because of his reputation today, that's a hundred times more impressive than just being a salesman. And, you know, finally, for the first time in her life about her father, her face just lit up. I mean, that was, it was a marvelous thing. So anyway, any, anything else? Did you notice how many of them died in their late 40s? You know, it, it's, I, I don't know whether you can create a statistic with this, but these men were very creative, very imaginative, some of them, and they also were complicated men. A lot of them drank too much, uh, whatever, had various problems, tilling has. Hugh Wilson, I won't go back to him, but he always reminded me in a few photographs, he almost to me looked like a young JFK. And the fact is he, he did sort of look like him, his physiognomy and everything. And I think he suffered from exactly the same thing. He was a good-looking guy, but he had all kinds of problems, and he just died at 45, just like you know, Kennedy probably wouldn't have lasted that much longer either. He was such a sick man. But I don't know about that, but and then others 
Uh, Tillinghast was um, manic depressive, you know. And George Crump, we didn't actually document this until a few years ago, actually shot himself right at Pine Valley. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know if Wayne's going to get into this, but what about William Flynn? Yeah, um, I, yeah it's, it's a very interesting question. When Tom and I first started doing this book on William Flynn, we didn't know we could write a pamphlet on, on him because there, you know, it, it, the history of golf architecture was really just starting about then. Uh, it, came, it came about um, somebody noticed that uh, three of the four major champions, uh, three of the four major USGA events were being held on a Tillinghast course. And they started think, you know, thinking more about uh, who they were back then and, and uh, what kind of results came about. So when Tom and I started the book, we were, we were struggling. The, the internet wasn't that uh, you know, resourceful in terms of digitizing newspapers and magazines. And uh, I called up uh, David Gordon, who was William Gordon's son. They were, they were, they were architects of a certain era, the 60s. And, um, he goes, oh, you should see what I have in my barn. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, I've got all his old drawings. So he had, so there was a, two boxes of, uh, of, pan, of folders, and they weren't, they weren't the complete set, but they are the most complete set of any Golden Age architect's drawings. There were, I, I've digitized them. I think there are 2,000 drawings, uh, whole draw, individual whole drawings, which I'll show you what they look like, routing maps. And Tom mentioned earlier what a beautiful art, artist he was. His drawings are just incredible. And uh, you see some of them in, in, around the clubhouse, the, those blueprints that are up. Um, so uh, that, all of a sudden, we couldn't stop writing. And the, you know, I couldn't stop writing. He was a terrible editor, by the way. Um, it's uh, almost 2,300 pages now. So what we thought was, you know, how are we going to get to 20 pages through? How much, how much text? 400,000 words. I don't know what that is equivalent to. Um, here's a picture of William Flynn at the 1939 Open. There he is. And, you know, Ben Hogan was a s small guy. I think he was 5'7", 135 pounds or something. You know, Flynn is significantly, he's on a, he's on a slope, but Flynn was significantly smaller than he was. But, um, you, can, you know, look at, the, look at the, this is an interesting picture. Just look at the way Byron Nelson and Ben Hogan are looking at Flynn. Was, you know, they were not down on them or anything like that, they, with, with admiration, I think. This is at Philadelphia Country Club. This is on the, what's now the 18th green, which is now the practice green of Philadelphia Country Club. Um, here, Flynn, uh, Tom and I, you know, just, you know, wrestled with these issues for many years, but we think of William Flynn as a transition architect. He had one foot in the, into the, uh, the, the golden age of architecture, but he was really pushing American architecture in a completely novel direction, in my mind, using perception miscues. He'd have greens that are on, an, uh, on a diagonal or bunkers that are on a diagonal, but they look like they're perpendicular to the line of play. So if you played from one side of the bunker or one side of the green to the other, it might be as much as two club differences. He hid, he hid uh, features with top lines of bunkers that were raised. These bunkers around the golf course, uh, have a certain look today, but that's not what they look like when in Flynn's era. They would be have sand flashed high on the faces, like you see at Marion, um, and they'd be less systematic in their look, if I, if I can say it that way. Um, so, so Flynn utilized uh, angles uh, and and uh, misperception. You, you know, if you play some of the dog legs of William Flynn. He wants you, a lot of times he wanted you on the outside of a dog leg to have a favorable angle in. So the hole played longer than it would as if other architects like you to play, you know, along the inside of a dog leg and have a favorable shorter approach shot in if you cut across the dog leg where he would fake you out and want you on the outside of the dog leg. And you can see that in the first hole here, the current first hole. Much more advantageous to be, well, the trees are one issue, but the angle of the green really dictates play from the right-hand side of the fairway. So you might have a wider fairway back then. They were probably 50, 60 yards wide. 
because of the maintenance practices back then, but you really had to be in certain particular portions of fairways to have the, uh, the, the right angle in. And try to remember back then there weren't irrigation systems, there weren't you know million dollar, two million dollar green budgets. These gr these golf courses were hard and fast, and, and the architecture was designed for those kinds of maintenance practices. So. Uh, you know, in today's equipment, 460 cc heads and titanium this and graphite that, uh, and balls that just rocket off the club face. These golf courses today re remain a challenge, but they were especially challenging back then, and more so because the maintenance practices together with the architecture, what Tom calls maintenance mill. So yes, his, you know, he termed his uh, design strategy a scientific approach to bunkering, to angles, to perceptual miscues. Tom mentioned, oops, his, his, he limited his yearly output. I think the height of his, uh, the most golf courses he ever had going at one time was 1923. And I think it was seven golf courses. But generally he was doing two or three golf courses a year and spending a lot of time on site. Think about, you know, the, the, the Donald Ross, who did 400 courses in about the same, a little bit longer time span, but you know, that was a, he had, he had a, a factory basically approach to things. And some guys today, some architects today have a more crafted approach, the Tom Dokes, the Gil Hanses, the Corin Crenshaws, and then you have others that you know, did sort of larger you know, volume approaches like a Fazio that you know, became famous for, for that, but uh, in my opinion, suffered a bit in terms of uh, quality that was lost. Um, Flynn designed uh, his routings on paper uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, he'd come up with different hole designs, different concepts. While he's on site, you know, generating these ideas on paper rather than on the ground, which uh, coming from Quaker Philadelphia is a much cheaper, better approach. Um, he drew, and, and this is really interesting, because Tom and I have been doing uh, consulting at some golf courses, and he would draw exactly the way the golf course was built. So for instance, down at the Cascades, we were we, they wanted to do, we're not architects, but we can help with historical restorations. We overlaid mo um, old aerials on top of his drawings, and they fit perfectly. It's just, it's just amazing how accurate his drawings were as to what was built. Um, and Tom noticed this today. If you look at his whole drawings for this course, uh, especially on a dog leg we'll, where he'll have a turn, he'll have a landing area that might be 200 yards, it might be 260 yards. It would depend on, you know, if it was uphill or downhill, down prevailing winds, up prevailing winds, and, and maybe strategy, as, as you found out today. So we're always learning something, or always making something up, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so he, he meant for his golf courses to be constructed like they were drawn, and he had his own uh, construction crew. Toomey and Flynn was the construction company. I, I'm sure you've heard that you know this course was designed by Toomey and Flynn. Toomey didn't do any design work, but he was the, the, the managing partner of their construction company. And he kept these guys on for his entire career. So it was a very efficient way to do golf, des golf design and development. He was one of the earliest and best uh, agronomists in America, one of, the, one of the top two or three architects maybe of all time. And he had one of the top construction crews. So he, he, he in a one-stop shop, offered everything from beginning to end. Here's a, an example of what his whole drawings looked like. This was Denver Country Club. Actually, he designed this course to be, re uh, he prepared a re total redesign of the golf course. They thought it was too difficult, so they didn't, they didn't implement very much of it. And today, Cherry Hills, which he designed uh, in the same town, gets all the notoriety and press and tournaments while Denver Country Club you know, stuck to their sort of members kind of course. But if you look here, there's a whole bunch of construction, oops, sorry, construction instructions, how big, how big mounds were supposed to be, how deep bunkers were supposed to be. And here, he, he laid out where, what the height of the greens were. So he, he detailed, in some cases, to the inch, what uh, the heights of, of the contours were on greens. And you can see he used a scale, uh, 550 yards. Sometimes he'd be up here if the, if the, if the uh, balls were longer than 550 yards. He believed very strongly in um, elasticity, being able to lengthen a golf course. Because think about his era. He went from uh, the, gutta, the gutta percha to the Haskell ball, which, 
and steel shafts from hickory shafts. So you know, he saw what technology did to golf in America. And even in 1927, he wrote that someday, if they don't do anything about the ball, they'll have to build 7,500 to 8,000 yard courses. Unfortunately, he's proved correct. We, we like to think of uh, you know, this design aesthetic as minimalism, a combination of minimalism and naturalism. And by that I mean <coughs> minimalism, it takes a lot of talent and creativity to utilize what's already there instead of forcing and manufacturing what could be there. So I think Flynn was really good at using the natural features, the, the, the slopes, the waterways. You have excellent use of streams here. And he did like trees unlike a lot of uh, architects, especially Scot Scottish architects, because there weren't any trees on the Lynx courses. And they, were lo they cost less to build and less to maintain, which was very important to him as, a, as one of the great agronomists and, and superintendents in American golf. But where he needed to create architecture and build something that, that's man-made, he made it look natural. It's one of the things that sort of, in my mind, and, uh, uh, hurts his reputation to a degree, because it looks like he just used a great piece of property, and the course is great because the property is great, but we look at his construction drawings, his, his uh, topographic maps that before the golf course were built, and you can see how much uh, he really did to create that natural look, and it's kind of lost on people that, that just think that it's you know by happenstance rather than design. So um, he was one of the great routers, as Tom said. He could go to a site like the Cascades, where Tillinghast was there, Rayner was there beforehand, and they all said, you can't build a golf course here. And one, in one day, Flynn said, if you buy this quarter acre, or actually you kick this guy that's you know, squatting on a quarter acre plot, I can design you a great golf course there. And he, and he was able to do that in a single day. When you say Cascades, are you talking about the homestead? Yeah, the upper Cascades yeah. course. Um, Oh, triangulation's kind of interesting. One of the things that, uh, the old style golf courses, which you went, when you went up and back, well, you had a certain wind direction going out, and you had a different direction coming back, or in the case of national, the wind changes in the afternoon, and you'd have a very similar wind from th throughout the whole round. Flynn would triangulate, and you guys that are sailors, or, you know, wind would come at you from different directions, and, and uh, it, it's, you know, it's something more, it's, it's an invisible sort of, hazard, so to speak, that you have to take into account. Um, Flynn wasn't, you know, he didn't care about par. He, you know, today's modern golf, especially if you go to China, for instance, they think par 36, 36, par has to be 72, has to be 7,500 yards, has to have all this systematic. Well, Flynn wasn't, uh, you know, constrained by that at all. Here's Flynn at Springdale. You know, it doesn't, the property doesn't have tremendous dramatic landforms, but it does have great contours and features like the stream that, that were used to, you know, to in influence design and, and strategy. He varied approach shots by, dic you know, by bunkering and the, the angles of the greens and the proper approaches. Some of the bunkering that, that used to exist doesn't exist anymore, and the trees take the place of bunkers, and, you know, uh, it's just a question of, you know, it's, it is, um, you know, what you like better, bunkers that dictate strategy or trees that dictate strategy. The thing that's easier to maintain a bunker, trees grow and die and um, leads to, you know, changes in, in the way the golf course plays. Flint, you know, Tom should probably talk about this, but shot testing. Flynn was very interested in making sure that, um, and taking luck out of the equation, in tournament play that, you, that the golfer was tested. You might have to hit a draw off a fade lie, a fade off a draw lie. You might have to hit a driver to a par three. So um, he, believed, and he believed very strongly in a, in a golf course being requiring the golfer to play all kinds of shots and you couldn't get away without a, a skill set that, that uh, enabled that. Uh, you know, here I said that you know, he, he made things look natural and if you look at Flynn's greens, these greens out here are, are great examples. They're, they're, you know, among the great Flynn greens. There's long interplays of slopes. They're hard to read the breaks, hard to read the speed that, that's required, and the combination of speed and line are, are really subtle. And uh, it makes it uh, more of a challenge, and the learning curve is longer. So if you're a member of a club, it's, m it's more interesting to uh, have those kinds of longer-term 
uh, figuring out uh, approaches. Here's Flynn's design for Springdale. You'll notice a lot more bunkers. The bunker shapes are a lot different than the ones you have out there. And if you look at, I, I, don't, I guess I can't make this larger, but if, if somebody wants to come and look at this later on, the, green, the bunkers were, are in the fairway, the bunkers abut the greens. There, there's much more interplay between the, the, uh, the intended areas of play and the, the hazards. So um, sl shots that were slightly mishit were, were penalized a little bit differently than they are today. How much did he change between the Jerry Lambert design and his concept? I, I mean, I'd say the bunkering and the angles of play are much more sophisticated than Lambert. It's hard to say because Lambert, not a, all of Lambert's designs, I, I don't think, were incorporated. You saw that 1924 photograph with that square green and the linear bunkers. That that's not on the plan. So, but Malcolm's been well, studying that a little bit. The, the routing was changed slightly. But yeah. In essence, it's the same, same routing as the Lambert's, but the sophistication of the whole the, the, all the greens were rebuilt. Mm -hmm. so the, the Lambert greens were erased, and the new greens were built with this uh, model. And as you can see, the bunker the Lambert. More of the old-fashioned lateral, you know, type of hazards which you had, had to shoot over. They even had one of the old cop bunkers from the gun course mm -hmm. that they retained and kept those Lambert uh, iteration of the golf course. <coughs> um, but the routing is the biggest change in the routing is our current number nine, which plays as a dog leg by Glenn, where that used to play as a straightaway. Mm -hmm. And um, current uh, one is, uh, was it oh, one let's is just so you get or, or oriented, this is where the graduate green, college is, green, and here's your clubhouse. Design. It was a double green. Um, Which one was double green? One and three yeah. today, in today's routing. That was around uh, here, right? A double green and mm -hmm. much more straight away in the Lambert design. But you can see it very well from the photograph that Wayne showed earlier. Mm -hmm. and from the down here, reflection. I have that photograph. We're going to put it up on the website here. Another feature that uh, Flynn liked to use is, you know, extending the fairway around greens. So there would be short grass collection areas. If the ball missed the green, it would travel further away. You have a collar of rough very close to the green, so if balls are... We, we did a tour of the front nine today. There was tremendous potential to have these chipping areas around. And, that, and that's just mowing grass. Yeah. yeah. And it was a real interesting place. It would be really be a lot of fun. Um, what else is there? We've lost a lot of bunkers. I mean, there's quite a bit. Here you can have five or six. There's lost a lot of bunkers. I keep talking about this where we have we planted trees and the trees have grown up and we took the bunker out. But now we've, we've been corrupted the Flynn's design and intent by taking the bunker out and having the trees that are Go back. A lot of those trees are dying because they're pin ups or otherwise it's old. So it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting It's kind of at a situation. crossroads almost. It's an interesting situation right now. Yeah, let, let me say something about that. This drawing is a good example, since it has a scale on it, but this is the way all these courses of this era were built. You can see all these fairways are all approximately the same width. So in those days, they didn't seem to you know, move the fairway widths around for strategy. So why were they all the same width? Well, we really don't know. We think it probably had to do with the maintenance equipment. In those days, they had these tractor-drawn gang mowers that were actually enormous. They sometimes would have five or six of them or ten of them actually side by side. And they would do that, they would just go back and forth and they created that old light and dark cut you now see because of restoration architecture that's coming back. Um, and so because they did, I think I asked no, Lucas the other day, they would do like three passes each way and that would create 55, 60 yards. So it wasn't it was really maintenance driven that they did it that way. And then, right after the Second World War, where all of a sudden there's all this construction equipment coming out of the war effort, um, they started doing commonly center line irrigation. And those center line irrigation systems only had a cast of like 17 yards on either side. So that was a little less than 35. And that's, that's why almost all American fairways that's shrunk down to approximately 35 yards. But what happened is that loss of fairway of 10 to 12 yards on either side. 
they started planting trees. And, 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 also bunkers that were originally And that's why bunkers that were, were in right touching are now way out the road. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can see that a lot. There are bunkers in the fairway all over the place. And the, in many cases, these, I don't know whether spring or this way, but fairways went right into the bunker. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you, you could really catch bunkers all the time. You didn't get, you didn't have this cut that caught the ball before. And, and some, when some of these bunkers were built, it could be because of drainage or talent or lack of talent. Some of the bunkers were sort of built up and flat and then, and then, then dished out. So the balls won't go into the bunkers because there's an upslope and generally surrounding it by heavy, fairly heavy rock. Some of the bunkers are probably just the visual they on turn number 10. That bunker, uh, just from what I saw of the old drawing, was only you know, 180 yards to carry So that really wasn't meant to be catching shots. Well, Look, 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 look at this though, there's only one tee on most of these holes. Right. So if everybody's playing from the same tee, there was a, there was a different uh, uh, hazard or, imp or strategic <coughs> design but for the different players. Was, was there a visual element? Oh, absolutely. If you play Marion, there's a bunch of bunkers that, that are just more, some of them are sentinel bunkers, this is the way you should go, or, but you know, they're not, they weren't always in play. Some of it was aesthetic. Uh, let me show you a good example of uh, you, we, this was the hole we're looking at where the buildings appear. Yep. Oh. Uh, that's a short par. Uh, that's a yeah. par three. This is. Oh, where's the one? The square where the square green was. No, the, right behind it's all this new building going on. Which one is that? Is that the, the new building. No, that's right, uh, John. That's the short par three where they were building the new arts. Okay. So oh, just yeah. to answer your question about aesthetics, you know, this is obviously is strategic to have these bunkers right in front of the green. But if you're looking at it in two dimensions, you know, it's like, is that penal or whatever? But the fact is, the upslope to that green is enormous. And if you just had that with grass, it's like right in your face. So he would break it up artistically with bunkers, things like that. He did that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a 1939 aerial that shows you know, within 10 years or so what the golf course looked like. And, gen and, with, and uh, actually with the depression and all, there wasn't going to be any changes in between down there. But you do see trees were starting to be added. And they were added in ways that created, not that, you know, that created um, sort of um, framing of the holes, but that didn't create corridors of, of, of holes. Of course, you know, trees became more popular. They were cheap to, you know, plant. And maybe so, some places they went overboard. This is this is the this is it today. Although this isn't you know compared to a lot of courses, this is you know this isn't as dramatic as it gets. Actually, you should mention Wayne that that looks like huge big trees, but that's shadow. Oh the, yeah, this is yeah. take this is taken in the, in generally these pictures are taken later in the year when the sun is low and the shadows are you know cast pretty long. And there's your new clubhouse and this one this outstanding feature here is this. The graduate tower, which was, you know, Flynn utilized quite well in some of the backdrops of a bunch of holes. So that's about it. Not, not you know, not too many snores. So I guess <laughs> that's it. Oh, can I just show on the first slide? Oh, thanks. <laughs> this is for Tom and I. Do we? Do you have questions? Hurrah for the red and the blue. <coughs> We're Quakers. <laughs> You're, you're, you're okay. Oh, with it. Pen. Yeah, right. <laughs> we can we can do some questions, right? Yeah, sure. I got a question. You know, um, Lynn had a bunch of interesting people on his. Should staff. I stay up here or sit down? What's that? Should I sit down or whatever you want to do? Whatever you're comfortable. Stay. Tom says to stay. Um, uh, Lynn had a bunch of interesting people on his staff that. Oh. Off the that that's a good point. Good. Yeah. Um, these guys stayed with Flynn throughout their careers. Um, William Gordon and Red Lawrence were the two construction foremen. Uh, you know, unlike uh, Dick Wilson's retelling the story, they were they were the two construction foremen. Red Lawrence is famous for what's that course out in Arizona? Uh, some Desert Forest. And uh, William Gordon, you know, Saucon Valley and a bunch of other places. But you know, the, the sort of a uh, guy who got in a lot of trouble with Flynn because he took some liberties with designs was uh, Dick Wilson, and he was probably the, the most prominent of the people that came out of Flynn's camp. Dick Wilson's brother worked for him. Dick Wilson did some changes at Shinnecock that Flynn 
didn't like and he fired him on the spot, but William Gordon con convinced him to keep him on. Harry Maxwell? He worked on some Flynn courses, but I don't, I don't think he worked for, with Flynn at all. Yeah. Um, Dan Maples, the Maples family from North Carolina, they, he, wor he was a construction, for, um, he worked on the construction crew for Flynn. But yeah. What well, can you tell us about Flynn in Glenview? Oh, Glenview. Um, this is in Chicago, in Golf, Illinois. Um, he did a redesign you know, similar to the task he was asked to do here, they didn't implement everything that, that he did. I'd say maybe, I don't even think they did, they did 50% of what he wanted to do. It could be, um, for a variety, we don't know what reasons they are, but uh, um, Jim Urbina is currently working with Glenview and uh, he's using the, the Flynn plants quite a, quite a bit, either restoring what was lost or maybe putting in what was never put, what was never there. It's got some more contour than most of the golf courses in the Chicago area have. So, mm, does that answer you? Yeah, I was just curious if, there, if he was at all influential about the caddy program that exists there, or did that all come out? I, I don't know. You mean the 